Welcome to the Energy Central Power Perspectives podcast. This is the show that brings leading minds from the energy industry to discuss the challenges and trends that are transforming and modernizing our energy system. And a quick thank you to West Monroe, our sponsor of today's show. Now, let's talk energy. I'm Jason Price, Energy Central podcast host and director with West Monroe, coming to you from New York City. With me, as always, from Orlando, Florida, is Energy Central producer and community manager, Matt Chester. Matt, today is an episode I know we both have been quite excited for because it comes at the intersection of two of our passions, the energy industry and professional hockey. Matt, you grew up in the tri-state area in the 1990s, so I assume you've long been familiar with today's guest. Yeah, you're, you're right about that, Jason. You know, I've, I've always been a sports fan since I was young, and I can recall fondly both attending in person and watching on TV games featuring today's guest, and uh, even, I think, uh, assuming his avatar in a few video games. So the fact that uh, a few decades later, here we are with the chance to have him on our podcast and discuss what is now the focus of each of our careers in clean and efficient energy technologies, it, it feels a little bit like a, a full circle moment. Good stuff, Matt. And as a New Yorker in my core and a big sports fan, I share those sentiments. We're fortunate enough to welcome to the podcast today the U.S. Hockey Hall of Famer and the 1994 Stanley Cup champion, Mike Richter. And as much as I know you and I want to just gush over his illustrious career in the world of hockey, since he hung up his skates in 2003, he started another quite impressive career in the world of energy. Specifically, he went to Yale to get a degree in ethics, politics, and economics with a concentration in environmental policy and founded the Environmental Capital Partners, a $100 million private equity fund for resource efficiency, before becoming president of Brightcore Energy in 2016, a company that provides end-to-end energy efficiency solutions to the commercial market. We definitely are eager to hear about both of these impressive careers and perhaps the intersection of them. So without further ado, Mike Richter, welcome to the Energy Central Power Perspectives Podcast. Jason, thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, Matt, uh, we've had some good conversations leading up to this, so I am really happy to be here. This is great. Awesome. Oh, we're thrilled to have you. You are here to talk about clean tech and your role in the energy transformation. Indulge our listeners on your journey from U.S. Hockey Hall of Fame to what brought you to the energy industry and CEO of Brightcore Energy. Well, you know, it's um, in some ways a bit logical. You know, all competition rewards efficiency. And um, if I'm a more efficient skater than you, I'll get the puck more than you do. If you're a more efficient runner, you're going to win the race. And business is no different. So. The products that you create, the operations within your four walls, all of them are going to help your bottom line if they're more efficient. And when you're speaking about energy, the reduction of waste, i.e. more efficiency, happens to coincide very well uh, when you're dealing with a fossil fuel-based culture with a, a decreased carbon footprint. And that's what we're trying to do. So we are looking to make buildings specifically more efficient operationally by changing the infrastructure inside them and new builds as well have more efficient operating systems and no different than cars evolved over time to have lower uh, miles per gallon used uh, for transportation we're hoping that buildings have less carbon molecules per day of use and um, there's great off-the-shelf technology to do that and so i do think there's that intersection it seems somewhat plain to me but the broader question is, why would you ever do that? When I retired from hockey, you know, you live in this incredibly insular world um, as a professional athlete. And I, I loved every bit of it. I would be doing it now if my body would allow me. And I was really intrigued about the personal challenge. But I think the aspect that is somewhat bothersome is I've had such good fortune in my life and so many people that helped me along the way. And there's a lot of serendipity and luck involved and hard work, of course. but I can't say I made the world a better place because I stopped a hockey puck. And I can say that if you put your mind and your capital and your effort to making the world cleaner and the air and the water, um, 
you are making the world a better place. And I do think you can make a dollar doing it. Uh, the capital markets are a big part of the solution here. So I feel like this journey is a way of, and maybe it's, it's a little self-aggrandizing, but you're helping the world get to the place it needs to go because we need to get there desperately fast. Well, let's stick with being personal. So in our prep call, you got personal and shared how your two sons, athletes in their own right, influence your day-to-day -day thinking on the world they will inherit. Tell us about how this thinking is shaping your direction at Brightcore Energy. Well, we are a for-profit company, of course, and I think this, going back to where we just left off, this is a, an important consideration for everybody, for people running their businesses, for building owners, for the people that are living in these buildings. I mean, we're sitting in the middle of New York right now, and you know, somewhere between 60 and 80 percent of the greenhouse gas emission comes from the built environment. You have Elon Musk doing things with cars. Now Ford comes in with a, a truck that leapfrogs that, and you're able to plug in your house and use it as, as a battery for your home. We're not talking about, and this maybe you can get into this later, but we're not just saying green for green sake. This is green for human sake. This is a better environment in which to live, to work, to breathe. And I remember I got onto the board of some local environmental groups uh, like Riverkeeper when I lived here in New York. And a lot of it was to do the work that they're doing and support it because I believe in it deeply. But also it's also to learn how to operate in a, in a whole different environment. My, I'm, I'm out of my element when I left the rink, really. here, I was 38 years old and looking to start a new career. And someone once called me a surprise environmentalist. And I thought, well, as an athlete, I'm a surprise environmentalist. First question is like, what does an environmentalist look like? What does somebody who cares about the environment look like? And I would argue it is everybody. This is not a political thing. Whether you're conservative or liberal, you want clean air, clean water. How you go about it may be different, but I think we all do want the same thing. So this is something that is very much necessary in our society and supported by people pretty much across the society. And there's definitely arguments on how to go about it. But I think most people would expect it's government, it's capital markets, it's NGOs, it's everybody to do it. So I think there's a really large swath of untapped demand out there for what we're offering generally. And I say we, I mean, the, the energy industry writ large doing cleaner energy. We all want it. We love the fact that there's not tailpipe emissions on these cars. Can you clean up the production of them? Sure. This is about better though. It's not about simply saying, boy, I want my building to perform with a low carbon footprint. And therefore I'm gonna make sacrifices, you know, to put on the cardigan sweater and, and turn down the heat, that's not it. We're talking about heat pumps and uh, lighting that's aesthetically more pleasing and more controllable and more durable. That's maintenance, lower operating costs. And of course, with that efficiency comes a lower carbon footprint. So I would absolutely switch the word um, green or sustainable with the word better. We're making better products and we should be evolving toward using them as quick as we can. Interesting. So now that you're in this space, what has been the major points of learning for you? What what are the hurdles you saw in the energy world that you were that were previously perhaps invisible? Well, first of all, business itself. It's a contact sport. It's very difficult. Starting a company, I, I had a few efforts in, in that regard and it's wonderfully challenging. I think you get up in the morning when you're tired and not seeing success. And if you feel like there is a real reason to be like, you know, we are trying to move the world and our society to a, a better spot. It helps the motivation for sure. But also you, you want to have success at whatever you touch. And um, so I, I have found how challenging and interesting and difficult the business world is generally and running a business is specifically. I've had tremendous help by really good people around me and I'm surrounded by just two other awesome partners and, and a really foundationally our, our company has just good people. So I'm, I think the success comes with that. Also, I think the word inertia comes up a lot in our four walls. There's so much opportunity out there, billions and billions of dollars to be put to work in, in, in just the CNI space, the, uh, the commercial industrial space, the mush market where we work, we don't really do residential. And there's plenty of good competition and bad competition out there, but there's room for all of us to be very successful. What the difficult part is, we don't lose jobs necessarily to the competition down the street as much as it, it is just inertia. You know, why do we still drive all the internal combustion system cars? Because that's what we're used to driving, inertia. How do you change the infrastructure of a society? You know, it's pretty easy to badmouth fossil fuels, but it 
is in everything that we do. And it's hard to just turn that around overnight, but we have some time pressure to make that exactly happen. And that's why it, it does take all hands on deck. But I think you have to never be satisfied, but also have patience to understand there's a perceived risk to anything new. There's a little bit of a, an aversion to change. The adoption of electric vehicles has been a long time coming. You can argue that they're superior in many ways, and there's still improvements we have to make in terms of range and how quickly you can charge them and whatnot. But there are no oily floors and oil changes and gas station stops. There's different things. And, and I think we have to get accustomed to that because progress means that you have to do things differently and that can be uncomfortable. And that's, that's a real lesson that we learn every day. So in your work, you're constantly trying to collaborate with the utilities to put forth solutions that work towards a common goal. Yeah. But just sharing that vision isn't always enough. Mm -hmm. We've had a lot of listeners who think like you and work for the utilities. So what have you learned about how to partner with them most effectively? And what advice would you offer to the utility leaders listening in on how you wish the process was perhaps made easier for people in your shoes? No, it's interesting. I had read somewhere where the utility industry is the most hated industry in America. I'm not sure that's true, but people love to hate them. Mm -hmm. And I have found across the board that these are intelligent, dedicated, and quite lovable people. Honestly, I, these are very smart people running these very complex systems. I've read a little bit about how our grid, however you want to define that, has come to be. And it, nobody waved a magic wand and said, this is the biggest machine on earth. That's, here's how it operates. It started in different areas. It's connected in, I don't want to say haphazard ways, but this thing evolved over time and it is still evolving and we absolutely rely on it. So again, you want to talk about inertia? How do you change this, you know, the fundamental operating system for our energy and change its source, its ability to um, hit more demand? And, you know, I've got three boys. We all have our cell phones and computers and gadgets. And so I just look at my house and how much electricity draw that I have, right? We have increased our demand on a, probably on a per capita basis over the last couple of decades. And that does not seem to be slowing down. And then you start saying, well, if we have to phase out fossil fuels, how do you do this with the intermittency of, of the energy um, sources? So it's the clean energy sources. It is so difficult to accomplish what they've been tasked with accomplishing, and we are asking them to do it yesterday. So I think I have a real appreciation now for how difficult it is. And I will say, I mean, look, we're a New York State-based company, and what's going on in, in this state is phenomenal. I mean, they really are making our lives easier because they've got a hard job, and they're looking for people to come up with solutions and partner with them in, on various levels. And we've found great traction having conversations. How can we help you? You are, you know, right. our small tail shouldn't be wagging this dog, but where can we play? Because we as a company, you know, any enterprise wants scale and to go pick up the phone and cold call individual customers uh, one by one is going to be a long, hard ordeal. Whereas you sometimes have customers coming to Con Ed, for instance, is saying, gee, you know, I'm at end of useful life of this oil furnace. Is there a more efficient way? What direction can you steer me? How can I do this? But there's incredible incentives out there that people are working hard to do. Money comes, fills a coffer, you have to get it out the door, then it goes away. These things are inconsistent. They're not necessarily predictable. You know, our political cycles are a lot quicker than the cycle of transformation of our grid. So you're going to have different sensitivities and objectives and outlooks and philosophies that they all have to kind of roll with uh, while we're trying to rebuild what is the largest machine, I think, in the world, right? Our national grid. So I've been impressed with the groups I've spoken to and, and more and more we are trying to reach out doing the pilot projects. To me, that's a really fantastic opportunity for them and us because Look, I can knock on your door and say, I've got the greatest thing since sliced bread. But at some point, you put your money where your mouth is. And let's see how this thing operates. Let's see how you operate as a company, whether there's a, a road to be working together. But there's good people out there. There's a lot of off-the-shelf technology. And there's a lot of experimental technology that needs to be flushed out. And we're so fortunate here, right, in Con Ed territory and that grid territory. But all across, you know, we've, we've spoken to plenty, plenty of Utilities, but you have quasi-governmental groups like uh, New York Power Authority, like CERDA, um, that are just there to foster 
the ability to move to a cleaner future. And, you know, that, they're not just words. These guys are putting real money and real experiments and great big brains on this topic. So I've been very impressed with every bit of feedback I've had from the utilities you've spoken to and, you know, hope to do plenty more in the future. Yeah, I agree. New York definitely is a progressive state when it comes to energy policy. So you mentioned pilots. Are there any favorite pilots you could, could share with us? Well, the, the first one that comes to mind is we're doing a retrofit, a geothermal retrofit in a 129-year-old building on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And the technology we have has been proven in Europe, and we have exclusive rights to it here, and it's the ability to have a, a smaller drill rig, which you need to put the boreholes in the ground and use the thermal mass of the earth as an energy sink. Geothermal is incredibly... Uh, it's been proven uh, the closed loop systems have very low maintenance, very little failure, but very expensive to put in. And now you, with the, the tailwind of the uh, Inflation Reduction Act mm -hmm. and, and the fact that uh, you know there's mandates in places like New York City with Local Law 97, uh, where you have to start lowering your carbon footprint, it starts to make sense that people say, well, I'm not replacing oil with oil. And we're literally, we had a very committed board to seeing this through. We had a huge help from NYSERDA, a grant to, you know, for a, a special technology where you can use the ground as a thermal battery and preheat and pre-cool the ground so I can pull it out given what's going to happen uh, in, in the weather or the season coming up. It's absolutely fascinating. So this is a really interesting project where it's going to get most of the common areas. It'll diminish the greenhouse gases by something like 41% in those areas. We are drilling. We're taking apart a small drill uh, rig. Again, very rare technology that's been used overseas for probably a decade or two. And we're applying it here. And we can take this thing apart, put it in the freight elevator, go into the basement and drill the boreholes within the confines of the building's perimeter. So we never go on anybody else's property. And we just use the thermal mass that is you know, the, the bedrock of Manhattan. And a pretty cool metaphor. I mean, it used to be the coal room way back when. Then it changed to the oil room. Now it's going to become the geothermal room. So there's real progression and evolution there. And we're incredibly proud of it. But it doesn't happen without the help of some of the incentives and the grants that get these things off the ground. And that's the whole idea is, well, you know, why do you have these tax abatements and um, incentives? Because you want to use that tax code to incentivize the behavior we want. And the behavior we need and want right now is lowering our carbon footprint. And so very difficult to compete with legacy technologies if you don't have some kind of help to get off the ground. And uh, they've been awesome. Mm -hmm. So if I may, you know, we're going to have some, maybe some hockey listeners who may not be in the energy industry. Perhaps give us a, a skinny on geothermal. What exactly is that? So it, geothermal is basically a, a, a heat pump that instead of using air, that would be an air source heat pump, it uses the ambient temperature of the earth. If you go down in this area more than four feet, the ambient temperature is about 55 degrees across the seasons. So it's below the frost line, right? And so you think about we're a hot day, maybe it's 90 degrees out here in, in New York. So instead of pulling 90 degree air out and trying to cool that to 70, you're pulling 55 degree air out mm. to make air conditioning. It's a it's a small lift. It's a negative lift. And so just you're using electricity to have the heat pumps to pull it, just like your refrigerator does. In this case of a refrigerator, it pulls the heat out and expels it, usually onto the floor of the house, say your air conditioning, ironically, but it takes it out of the machine. This heat pump works both ways. So in the wintertime, it is drawing that heat from the earth at 55 degrees yeah. and then heating it up to 70 or whatever your house needs to be or your commercial industrial, as, as we focus on building. So... I think the, you know, coefficient of performance, as all the engineers say, can be, you know, four. It can be incredibly efficient, more so than any other, you know, option out there. What's been holding it back is it's hard to put in right and it's expensive. But with the IRA, um, we're looking at if you're using American-made, you know, majority of American-made products, which we can do pretty easily, we can get up to 40% diminishment on the upfront cap costs. So, it really starts to pencil financially. Yeah. And the operating costs are significantly lower and the maintenance costs, you know, your maintenance avoidance is, is really significant too. So you have a really compelling 
story, but people, you know, you, their eyes glaze over and you're going, you know, to sell this, you have to immediately get into the weeds with your engineers. And if the person on the other end of the table is not an engineer, they're going, you lost me. I mean, what are you selling me? You're asking me to dig up my, uh, basically a football field for boreholes. And, and I don't have that space in Manhattan. That's where we feel with this urban geo product. We have um, smaller rigs, directional drilling, very specific lack of, uh, you know, a, a 1% deviation as opposed to 10%. So I can stay on my property, not yours. These are game changing opportunities. The applicability of geothermal has really changed to this, these new technologies and the efficiencies always remained, but the big difference is the, the front end cost has come down and makes it viable. Yeah, it's been really interesting. When we chatted ahead of the podcast, you mentioned how much of this conversation and the work you're doing ties into performance. That is clean energy and high performance buildings lead to better outcomes. And you, know, you certainly reiterate just now. So social equity and environmental justice is equally important to your mission. But can you talk a bit about how you incorporate both these facets into your business model? I think it's fairly clear that if you have the means, you can have a pretty comfortable home, place of work, you know, money grants access, but the opposite is also true. And you think about there's over 500,000 people living in NYCHA housing in New York, the low income housing in New York. Those buildings often aren't maintained or built to the standards just because they're so expensive to maintain. So the experience of the people within those four walls can be pretty bad. It's very cold in the winter and you get supplementary heat and it could be a kerosene heater. And now you're really spoiling the air quality in your own apartment. So there's just a cascading of effects that expensive energy can can cause. Um, they're uncomfortable. You look at a lot of the um, schools in, in the city. I wouldn't want to be an eighth grader trying to get through my final exams on a mid-June 90 degree day without air conditioning. You know, when you start changing these buildings, operating systems to a better performing option, you start having better experiences for the people living and working in them, uh, whether it's home or school or work. And, uh, you know, our nation's schools need as much help as they can get. The problem is who's paying for this? It's expensive as heck to transform these things. But the flip side is who's paying for it now? It's you and I. Affordable housing, our public school system are incredibly inefficient buildings. And we're footing the bill for this, correct? That's tax dollars going out the window and the poorly sealed uh, doors and the inefficient boilers in their basement. So when we start changing these things, the operating cost comes down. So it's a net savings over time. And particularly for the institutions, for, for schools and universities, where you have a huge time horizon, you're not trying to flip this thing and sell it in three years and need an ROI of two years. You're saying, I just want to lower my operating costs and have something that's maintenance free as possible. And so it starts to make real financial sense to look at low-income housing and challenged areas of our nation and start to put in more efficiency. The f flip side is it starts to change uh, health outcomes. You know, we're so intricately woven to, you know, where we live and, and the cleanliness of the environment, the air we breathe, the water we drink, all these things affect our health. And if you have a great deal of people in these, you know, asthma corridors and whatnot, that's just from Basically, if you could argue inefficiency, that's diesels and, um, and peaker plants and whatnot that are not efficient, that are spilling out a lot of carbon. And so, I mean, when you start talking about efficiency, it's not a panacea, but there are a cascading effects that are very positive outside the bottom line. I would argue that the bottom line is the biggest thing, but the health effects, the quality of the experience inside the buildings and the people living in around those buildings that are cleaner is a remarkable difference. Yeah. What's your perspective on how we overcome inertia when it comes to the necessary energy upgrades that we need to make? I think part of the inertia equation is we, we, we still equate, at least as it comes to efficiency and energy progress with, um, <laughs> I guess, uh, making a sacrifice. And you can't emphasize enough early on, Maybe the electric cars were more of a, a small town vehicle that had a top speed, like a golf cart of 20 miles an hour. But I mean, you look at these cars coming out now, some from Ford, Rivian, Tesla, they can beat a Ferrari off the line. These are very, very high performing cars. We're still evolving what they're capable of doing. But if you've had the experience of driving some of these things, you realize it's, it's a better mode of transportation. And I think we have to get out of that mindset. We... Think about 
evolution in so many ways and we love progress. I mean, think about entrepreneurship and creativity in this country like few others do. But, you know, it was only a few years ago that our light bulbs weren't that far removed from what Edison was using. I mean, we really have a blind spot when it comes to the performance of these buildings, you know. I think about, you know, again, intersecting with my hockey career, there were times where I had more than once uh, some of the small rinks that we practice in shut down from OSHA because of the particulate matter was so high from this gas powered Zamboni that was going around doing the ice. And, you know, here you have the highly trained athletes, huge expense paid for salary, for nutritionists, for sports, you know, psychologists, the pinnacle of people's career. And you have this building that performs so poorly that you can't even go in it for health violations. And it's just this, it, I think it's indicative of the blind spot that we all have to this. You know, I have a wonderful house in Connecticut. It's from 1905. Well, if it's a windy day, my hair is blowing when I'm at the kitchen sink. That <laughs> does not perform particularly well. But if you look at a passive house standard, this is not a home or a commercial building built to make the spotted owl happy. This is to make you and I happy. This is to make it so that when it's 12 below zero outside, you're very comfortable inside without spending a fortune to have the heat. Where it literally will keep you alive for a number of days if your power does go out because the insulative qualities are so high. It's a, it's a thermos that you're living in. And that works for both heat and cold. And it's a, a wonderful thing. It's cleaner air you know, exchanges when you have the heat recovery. There's just so many positive examples that you can draw on that make our lives better when you evolve our energy systems, both writ large with the grid and internally in, in each building and our homes. So I think there's off the shelf technology that people aren't even considering because they're not making that connection. And when you start experiencing it, the conversation changes. I went to school in upstate New York and uh, I still go back. I have a little summer house there. And a friend of mine was putting in a passive house standard building. It was his home and really interesting guy. And he was saying, you have to come over and look at this thing being built. I knew the guys that were building it. I had an old boathouse that had to be redone. And these guys are tough upstate guys going, what the heck's going on here? You know, 18 inch thick walls. It's overkill. We've been building homes for decades and this is not how you build a home. And hey man, if he wants to spend money for no reason, I guess we're here. But there was a lot of skepticism and understandably so. It just was a different way of making the building envelope. But uh, I came back about three months later and the tune had changed dramatically. The windows were now in. It wasn't finished off inside, but it's about a 25 degree day in late November and it gets cold in, in the Adirondacks and uh, spitting snow outside. The guys, come here. We have no heat going on in this place. Guys are in t-shirts. It's quiet as a mouse inside. You can feel the difference from outside to inside simply because the body heat of the machines working, the drills and the, and the saws and the men working inside was able to heat that place up to a comfortable, you can be in a t-shirt. The performance of that envelope was almost breathtaking. And I have been back since the building has been completed. And the house looks normal from the outside. You don't notice it. But if you see a cross section of the wall, these are 18 inch thick walls. And it's so quiet and so comfortable inside. You wouldn't know it's anything different from the outside. But he knows every time he pays his bill, how little he's paying and how much the benefit is. So I think that's a, you have to make that connection that this is not a sacrifice. It's an evolution and we're moving to a better place. No, I'd agree. On a personal note, I toured and when I was in NYU in the clean energy program, we, we toured a couple of passive houses mm. in the Bronx. Yeah. Beautiful buildings. We've never been able to tell, you know, from the outside that this is a passive construction. But it's an entirely new way of thinking in yeah. terms of how to you know be energy efficient and build. All right. So Mike, you know that with Energy Central, we've had a number of leaders in the C suite mm. on the show. And chances are they're going to be listening to this. Sure. So if we could ask you to take out your crystal ball and engage with the utilities, with your organization, what would the conversation be like? And what message do we need to get across all stakeholders to allow the outcomes to become realities? Great question. I think it's gotta be a collaboration because I know what we sell. I know how good it is, but they know their pain points. And if I don't listen to them, doesn't matter what I sell. It'll never merchandise in well. So I, there has to be a real collaboration. But I, I do think there's a real spirit of partnerships out there. The other thing that keeps coming up is capacity. This grid is strained right now on a hot day. 
you don't want to see brownouts or blackouts. But the storm's getting more violent. The heat waves are getting more intense and longer. We're talking about building electrification. Understandably, this is fantastic. We're electrifying everything from our computers to the virtual office to our cars. I've got two electric cars I plug into my house. Well, I'm not paying for gasoline anymore, but I am paying for more electrons. They are cleaner even with, uh, with the, the mixture in the grid where I am, no question about it. So I feel good about that. Financial realities have to be there. They have to be beneficial. And I think there's a capacity thing. When I start plugging my car in to my own home, when I start changing that oil furnace to um, heat pumps or air or ground or electric furnace, I'm going to be using a heck of a lot more electrons. And so where's that capacity going to come from? Battery storage is coming, we know, but it's not quite there yet. The cost curve still has to come down. And you get that with scale, no question. But it's a really dangerous time because as we shut down things we don't want, more peaker plants and whatnot that are gas or oil or coal, that has to be replaced with clean energy. And you have to somehow get that intermittency down. So one of the things that we like to talk about is efficiency. That's using less and that's the cleanest, cheapest electron is the one you don't use, as everybody says. And so if you can start with that passive house, for example, or a ground source heat pump that just, you know, gets the same BTUs out there into the environment and uses less electrons to do it, it's a good place to start. Nobody wants to pick winners because things change, but we know that more efficiency always kind of materializes into savings. So that I think is a, is a wise place to be. And just the willingness to work. And I've, I've been really pleasantly surprised and impressed with just the tenor of our conversations because they understand their market. They understand how difficult, I mean, we have what 2% or so penetration of electric cars right now. What is it when it's 25%? It is going to be tough. And you get mandates coming down from often from policymakers that have you have great intention, but don't, don't understand the limitations of the grid right now or capacity to fill it with this increased demand. So it puts them in a very, very hard spot. So if the private kind of capital markets can work with them to start making a solve here and, you know, they have smart people, they'll kick the tires and see whether we're real or not, but it's happening in these pilot projects. Again, I go back to and say, yeah, where did it work? Where didn't it work? Where can we course correct to make this thing better? It's really an exciting time because we need scale. I don't mean we as a company we certainly do. And we are looking to do that. But we as a society, right. as a world, this can't be little one-offs. The fact that you are driving, you know, a hybrid car or an electric car is good and, and personally satisfying and helps. But it's a drop in the bucket. We need this to really take place very fast. And I don't think there's anybody that's more capable of making those changes happen than the utilities. Well, I certainly appreciate your candor with these questions. And I'm sure you've won over a few Boston Bruin fans. <laughs> I don't know if that's possible. <laughs> We're going to give you the last word on the show, but first we have what's called our lightning round, where we sure. get to learn a bit more about you, the person, rather than the professional. So we're going to ask you a couple of questions, and your response should be left to one word or phrase. Sure. Are you ready, Mike? I am ready. All right. Typically, athletes can play multiple sports. If not for hockey, what sport could you have also become a Hall of Famer? Oh. One word answer is probably none um, because I just I'm uniquely qualified for very little, but I love all sports. I, I pole voted when I was a kid. I played football for right through high school. I just competition. If you didn't have a organized sport, we'd make the crap up. I got two older brothers and lots of friends that I grew up with in Philadelphia and it was, everything was competition from eating apples to throwing them, you know? So I guess right now I'm short, heavy, not particularly aerodynamic. I love biking. It was something I did a little bit to train for, ice hockey and um all i do now is just buy better technology because i'm not getting any fit, fitter or faster but i would love to you know tour de france just got over and i love the technology and, and the difficulty and the strategy of it so i, I do love biking but I, you know I, I played football growing up and that was just such a fun thing to do i mean i would i would one of those two i would like but neither of them is realistic <laughs> yeah all right uh, as we all know, professional hockey is not classified as a gentle sport. Hmm. What was your diet like as an athlete? And what did you typically eat in the lead up to each game? Interesting. Um, I have two sisters that are diabetic and, and they had diabetes at a young, young age. And uh, so I'm the youngest of seven. And so I saw how much their diet can affect their health. And both of them were incredibly disciplined about avoiding sugar, of course. I have a wife who's celiac. And so there's always a cause and effect, you know, what we put in 
I had a coach once say, you know, your body is your vehicle to get anywhere, to play in the pros, to play in college. That's a Ferrari. Would you ever put muddy gas in a Ferrari? Like, what are you thinking eating that donut? I'm thinking it tastes pretty damn good is what I'm thinking. But the reality is there's a real cause and effect there. So if the more disciplined you are about what you eat, when you eat, how you eat, and your sleep patterns, I don't know an athlete worth his salt that, you know, got to any good level that is not anal about their rest, their nap schedule, and what they eat. That That is truly your fuel. And if you want confidence going into that championship game, you better have done the homework prior to. So I, I had a good grasp on nutrition from a very early age. Of course, I grew up in Philadelphia. I watched uh, Rocky movies and so I was like drinking eggs for no apparent reason other than they tasted horrible. But later on really got to understand, you know, the, the hydration and, and the nutrition aspect. You can have a game where we would have a pregame meal at noon. And if that goes into overtime, it could be two o'clock in the morning by the time you're done. And you go that long without eating, you're not performing well. So the snacking and the uh, and the pregame meals, what you ate, when you ate, a little bit of protein to have staying power. Boy, you got into a routine. I knew what I was going to eat, when I was going to eat. Four months from now, it was locked in. Part of it's superstition, but a lot of it is I've experimented. This is what works. So, you know, the chicken and pasta routine that most guys did before a game, I would do. I try to supplement as many vegetables as possible. You know, it's funny too. I'm, I'm 56 years old now, so you have to watch your diet for different reasons. I could eat anything I wanted to, you know, a cheeseburger at 11 o'clock at night and you burn it off. Not so much anymore. So I think it's a good reminder that the fundamentals matter. What's the ideal way for you to spend a Sunday afternoon? Well, I've got three boys that are now all, my youngest is going off, the, the last one to go off to college. So I definitely try to, wring that towel out or squeeze that sponge, I guess, as much as possible. When they're there, I'm there. You know, th- you drop whatever you can and you hang out with them because you know that's it's fleeting. I can recall being 18 and you know everything and you're ready to roll and get out of the house and go on to your next thing. And sitting at home hanging out with your parents is probably not what is first in your mind. And so they that's appropriate. They should be out doing what they uh, love to do with their friends and their next careers and on to the next thing. But you try to savor that because you know it's fleeting. Do you have a favorite hockey movie? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't think I do. Slapshot, I just, I never watched the entire thing from front to end. And everybody's got the great lines from that movie. And there are some really funny lines. I've grown to appreciate it. But I think Bull Durham came out when I was in the minors. And I resented it so much because I resented being in the minors that I couldn't even watch the thing from front to back. I've grown to love most of those flicks. But uh, no, I don't. I still have to see the 1980 movie, uh, I, I like documentaries more like the Red Army and whatnot that, because I've played with and against some of those guys. And I, I really do love seeing that, you know, all the ESPN 30 for 30s about the Red Wings and even Boston Bruins um, <laughs> have a great deal of uh, interest for me. So I like the docs more than just the funny ones. Who were your role models growing up and who are your role models now? Great. Well, I, I was lucky. I had great older brothers and sisters, and I've got a significant age gap between uh, the oldest and my family and me. So I was able to learn a lot from their mistakes and, and, their, and their triumphs. Um, so I think it's a lot easier being the young guy. My father was a really good person. Died when I was young, when I went off to school at Wisconsin at, at 18. But, you know, real disciplined guy. A bit of captain of World War II and very a great golf player and, and good at business. So, you know, it's impossible not to look up to your dad when you're young. And I had a very good role model with him and my older brother. So that, to me, was probably the best. But sports-wise, I was so fortunate. I grew up in Philadelphia again. The expansion team was the Philadelphia Flyers back in 68. And so by the time I was five, six, seven years old, kind of impressionable, everybody was watching the Flyers because they were a really good team. And, you know, they're an easy team when you're not from there to, to hate the Broad Street Bullies, you know, the way they played and everything else. But Bernie Perrant was a goalie, and he was a, is a Hall of Famer. You know, really slick, cool, French-Canadian guy. Won both of his championships with a shutout. Was supremely talented. I went to his hockey school a couple of years with my brother when I was a kid. And, you know, known to this day as a really genuine champion. And I was able to watch him. And, oh, everything from the number. I, I spent countless hours in class, like, just doodling about his new pads or his helmet. And I would imitate everything he did. And he was a good guy to imitate because he really had the fundamentals down. So that was the guy. But today, uh, I've got two great partners that have been construction finance on Wall Street for you know decade and a half apiece and then started this company. I was able to buy into it as, as a third partner. And 
I've lucky, you know, our investors, my partners, they're good people that handle themselves properly in the business environment and they're great role models for me. You know, guys like Elon Musk, um, you have to appreciate the chances that guy's willing to take. He puts his money where his mouth is. He puts his mouth in some funny spots too, but uh, he's been incredible. I mean, incredible what he's been able to accomplish. And so, you know, the drive that he has is kind of pursuit of excellence and, um, and his innovation is pretty impressive. It really makes science and technology and innovation sexy, like it's cool. And um, he's, he's changed our world. And how many people can you say that about? And I think it's a real indication from where we started this conversation, this progress, this evolution. And that's a very important thing for our culture to understand and our young kids growing up to embrace. Well, some great answers and great insight, Mike. Really appreciate it. And you've been a great sport with this lightning round. So we want to give you the final word. If our listeners take only one thing away from today's conversation, what do you hope for it to be? Well, we got to educate ourselves. That's a boring answer, but it's a really important one if we're going to fight inertia. What served us so well for 200 years does not anymore. And so we cannot educate ourselves and react accordingly quick enough. So it's all hands on deck. It is the little things like you getting a hybrid as opposed to a regular car or moving toward, uh, you know, changing your stove out. All these things, they're not political. It's about moving to the right place. It'll be a better experience, but the world, it's not just a nice thing to have. Reality, science demands it. Well, I must say this was a great conversation and we are really eager to continue to watch where you, really eager to watch where your work with Brightcore and the energy industry takes you. As you do, hopefully you'll pop over to energycentral.com and share updates and insights, as well as respond to any questions and comments that our audience shares for you on this episode. So until then, though, we just want to thank you for sharing your insight on today's podcast. Well, Jason, thank you. Matt, thank you. It's an honor to be here. It's a great program you have. And honestly, I am thrilled to be here. And I always learn a ton and it excites me to kind of take a step back from the day to day and think about um, long term. So I hope I can come back and uh, tell you some more stories of success. Absolutely. We would love that. And you can always reach Mike through the Energy Central platform where he welcomes your questions and comments. We also want to give a shout out of thanks to the podcast sponsors that made today's episode possible. Thanks to West Monroe. West Monroe works with the nation's largest electric, gas, and water utilities in their telecommunication, grid modernization, and digital and workforce transformations. West Monroe brings a multidisciplinary team that blends utility, operations, and technology expertise to address modernizing aging infrastructure, advisory on transportation exportation, ADMS deployments, data and analytics, and cybersecurity. And once again, I'm your host, Jason Price. Plug in and stay fully charged in the discussion by hopping into the community at energycentral.com, and we'll see you next time at the Energy Central Power Perspectives Podcast. 